You're listening to Blue Jays Nation Radio with Cam Lewis and Tyler Uremchuk, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Episode 180 of Blue Jays Nation Radio, as always, brought to you by Botano, the 2023 EGR brand of the year. The game starts now at Botano.ca, 19 plus. Please play responsibly, whether it's betting on baseball, betting on NFL football week two underway. Uh, bet responsibly at Botano. Coomzy, um, I bet on the Blue Jays last night. That's <laughs> But I also kind of regret flying across the country to watch this damn baseball team. That was a miserable evening at the Rogers Center. Yeah, I was going to say, how was it being one of the 500 people who showed up to watch this miserable slog, man? That was, we tried to manifest something. We were we were good vibes only after the Kansas City series. We talked ourselves into beating a team that's on pace to win 10 games this year. Sweeping them means something. And we got duped. We got fooled. The Jays... You know, I mean, I, I, I when I wrote the recap last night for the website, I, I said in my lead, my first line, that given the context, given the standings, given the team they were playing, the history, and the, the, there's no rivalry among these players anymore, yeah. obviously. But among the fans, sure, when you put all of that together, that's the most embarrassing series of baseball the Toronto Blue Jays have played in a very long time. Like, there weren't there weren't periods in 2018 and 19 when they were rebuilding that were more embarrassing than that. That was that was bad. I haven't seen a Blue Jays team trying to win like actively in a contention window at this time of year put together a performance like that. It was stunning. That was the worst thing I've seen in sports. In. And I and I'm I, I'm a, I'm a fan of the Edmonton Oilers, and <laughs> it's the worst thing I've seen in sports in a long time. <laughs> Well, it's just, it's expectations and it's the moment. And then it's like, it's the way it unfolded. Like, let's be honest. We'd probably have a bit of a different tone here if the Jays lost three of those games by one run and we're like right there and whatever. Like, yeah, we we would still be pissed, like obviously, but it's just something. And it says something about the state of this team when it's 10, 4, 6, 3, 10, nothing, 9, 2, and you don't even get close at any point. And not even that. Like watching this team as they went off the field at the Rogers Center, watching John Schneider and listening to his press conference after the game, there seems to be no frustration. This ties into, I think, a lack of honesty or recognition of the moment or a lack of, I don't want to say wanting it because I'm sure they want it really bad. They're professional ball players, but they're just, there seemed to be no sense of this is a big series. We need to be playing our best. There's pressure on us. They just seem to be going through the motions in that four game set. Just no response to any of the really bad shit that happened. And there was a lot of it. I wonder if, yeah, like I, I, I agree with you that there's, there's a lack of sense of urgency. And I also agree that it's obvious that the players, it's not that they're just disinterested. They don't want to win uh, or that they're, 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 they don't care. I don't, I really don't believe it's that. I think that's, that's, that's just kind of a lazy way to summarize things, but it feels like it almost feels like there's an expectation among them that they're just going to easily slide their way into the playoffs and there's no real work that has to be done. They're just going to get there based on talent. It's almost like, eh, I feel like we said this last year too, they they bought into their own hype perhaps and now here we are and you actually have to win the games against teams that recognize you need to win and have a good record to get into the playoffs. Even in the you know the the the, the new format when six teams make it, it's, it's still not easy because there's a hand handful of competitive teams in the mix it's not automatic and it, it almost feels like the Jays rolled into this series being like we can just talent our way to at the very least a two and two split with Texas where we're still you know we're still up on them yeah whatever they have the tiebreaker who cares like we'll do well in our series down the stretch because we're just that good it almost feels like they have that and the way Texas came in and beat the wheels off of them in front of their own stadium half full because nobody wants to pay money to watch I mean, that should be a wake-up call that you're probably nowhere near as good as you think you are. Yeah, here's what John Schneider had to say following the sweep this via Hazel May. Quote, that's not our best game by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> you, Yeah, you think? Uh, you know, you see what you're made of. I think we know what you're made of, John. He says, it's a big three-game series over the weekend against Boston. There is no other option than to move on. And I get that perspective, you know, like... And, and Schneider talked a little bit about how he hasn't been losing his cool. He says it's not productive to do the whole throw a chair, bang shit around in the locker room and scream at the guys thing. But at the same time, the current approach clearly is not working. This team has been 
inconsistent all year and incapable of stringing together long stretches of success. And again, in a big moment, similar to other big moments over the last month, they just seem to kind of wilt and, and just not live up to a big opportunity. And again, like that series, man, like if you would have told us when we recorded that episode Monday, Coombsy, like what's what worst case scenario, what would be rock bottom? I think we both would have agreed losing three out of four would have been worst case scenario and rock bottom. So like, what do you even call this? Like, it's just it's really, really hard. And I think we're a podcast that usually, you know, we were a fan perspective on this thing. We try to always find a positive angle to some extent. But like, after watching that four game series, I, I'm, I, I have a hard time even like wanting to root for them tonight against Boston because it's, it was just so dejecting to watch that. Yeah, that's where I'm at, too. And I, I, I really, really try hard not to be. Uh, I mean, we, we do this thing after every series, so it can be a little bit difficult not to. And, and this is the thing with everyone, fans, whether you're a writer in the media or whatever, it's, it's hard not to overreact to what just happened in the previous series in the previous three or four days that you just watched. But we, we try really hard to not make these like grand overarching blanket statements over like a four game sample. But the thing is, is the way they played in this Texas series was it, it, it's the nightmare that everyone had kind of had in the back of their minds since probably early May when they slowed down after their great April, you know, May, June, July, August. Sure. They, they were above water and in the playoff race and, are, I mean, they still are in the playoff race. It's not like they've yep. been mathematically eliminated from the playoffs, but there was always that sense, even when they were doing pretty well, winning, you know, seven of seven of 10 games here and there, winning, winning a series, winning another series, just chugging along, like kind of what we've been talking about. There was always this worry in the back of our minds that this is a team that cannot perform well when it matters most. They just don't have the juice for some reason. And it really feels like just sports cliches to say that. But and you see Texas come into town and, and do what they just did. And uh, you say like that's 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 this is even worse in the worst case scenario. But part of me low key isn't terribly surprised. The Jays did did really poorly in this series. Like look at how they have played against Baltimore this year when when the games get tough and they feel like playoff games, they they just wilt even in that in that 15 game stretch against pretty bad teams like. It wasn't easy. None of those wins felt particularly yeah. easy. Think about the Kansas City series. If it wasn't for Cole Reagan's forgetting how to throw a strike in the sixth <laughs> inning, if it wasn't for, you know, um, uh, a missed strike call on George Springer when he did swing and they called it a ball, or, you know, the relief pitcher in Kansas City getting hurt fielding, they could have lost two or three to Kansas City. Like, I think I think we wanted to be positive and we told ourselves the vibes were better at this time. And the the, the Jays have been showing pretty much all year this is probably who they are. And then it happened and yeah, it sucks to watch, but it's, it's, I don't know at this point, like, do you even really want to watch the Jays in the playoff series? Do you want to watch them go to the trop and play Tampa? Do you want to watch them go to Minnesota in the cold and face two of their better starting pitchers? No. Like, <laughs> where, 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 where do we get hope from now? Where, 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 like, how do we get excited? I, I don't know. Yeah, and I and I think that's kind of where I'm at too. Is like it, it's just very hard to have an idea in your head and have that hope of like, oh, they're gonna get hot for two weeks and like make this thing interesting because just nothing that we've seen over the last four and a half months gives us any reason to believe that they're even capable of that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what's coming up for a bunch of teams and and maybe why there's an outside chance to believe. I'll try to make that case in a bit, but we're not done breaking down this Rangers series. Let's get into our three downs from this one. Uh, number one is the existence of Corey Seager, Coombsy. Uh, the dude goes nine for 17. He finished a triple shy of the cycle in the final game of the series. He had another three hit game like the dude's just an absolute machine out there. And I think it was Brandon Weil from the score who had an interesting tweet or a tweet that I found interesting. And he basically just said, you know, it's weird because he got paid three hundred twenty five million dollars. But Corey Seager might be one of the more underrated players in the M in MLB. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, nine for 17, a home run, five RBIs, one strikeout, three walks. And then you juxtapose that to how Toronto's best or top three players performed. Uh, Vladdy goes two for 15. Bo goes two for 15. Springer three for 14. Uh, you combine all their strikeouts, 12 strikeouts compared to two walks between that group. Like the trio of uh, your top three hitters came nowhere near producing what Texas's best player produced. And I mean, 
that's that's just what it shows is at, at this time of year in September, your best players are supposed to be your best players. This team's built around having that top of the lineup, Springer, Bo, and Vlad around, you know, a team that supposedly pitches well and plays defense well. And that's how they're supposed to win ball games. And those guys just straight up did not come through. And then you see on the other side, look what happens for Texas when your $300 million superstar comes through and has an MVP caliber series. And that's the difference. You, you it's, there's, there's so many different things that went wrong in this series, but for me, it was, it was the lack of come through from the top players that was so disappointing and so dejecting. It's like, I think we saw last year in September, the Jays were, it was a roller coaster ride all the way up until there. And it was even a bit of a slog, like think late August, early September, Baltimore was getting close to catching them. It was, wow, are they really going to blow this? Things aren't looking very good. And then they kind of heated up down the stretch. Bo had that great September. Springer was good down the stretch as well. Vladdy was fine, but it just hasn't happened yet this year. We talked about that in the last show, like who's going to have a big signature moment, and no one did. Vladdy had a go-ahead home run in the first inning of the fourth game to try to avoid a four-game sweep, and that was the most exciting moment of the series from Toronto's bats. Like, that's 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 just bad. The, I mean, yep. at some point, we have to suggest the core of the team you've built around isn't good. Yeah, we talked at the beginning of the season about the pressure this team was facing because when you know when they lost to Seattle the year before that, when they lost to Tampa Bay, it was kind of this hey, young team learning their way. And the point I always made was you only get that excuse for so long until at some point it's to an extent the Maple Leafs syndrome, where at some point you just become chokers losers a team that's not good enough and i know that's not exactly the same because that leafs team is consistently a good regular season team like not an apples to apples comparison at all but with this jays team i think what we've seen this year is the shine of ooh, good young team ooh, they're just learning some tough lessons that shine is without a doubt gone especially when you go look at baltimore and baltimore's young guys just get get the job done right you look at the players tampa bay will bring up through their system they just come up they get the job done and then you look at the Jays and it's like these young guys, like you can't sit there and use the, oh, they're young excuse anymore. Like th- the results should be coming right now. That was our second down, a wildly, wildly disappointing series from Toronto's big bats. And I think that fourth game really encapsulated it as well. I mean, you go to the fifth inning, even Bo Bichette hammers a double. Boom. You got your guy on second base. You got Vladdy and Davis Schneider coming up. The game's tied at that point. You're like, they're going to get right back in this thing. No, back-to-back strikeouts. Bo Bichette strikes out with the bases loaded. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. gets a chance, strikes out as well. And it's like every big RBI spot they had in that series, they didn't just like get out. They like struck out in almost all of them. It was it was, um, the third down, and this is something that's been trending in this direction for a while. Uh, Coombsy, the bullpen's gassed. They got nothing left. No, the bullpen, I, we brought this up a few times, but I mean, the starters and the bullpen look gassed. Like, like they've, the, the bats have given the pitching no room for error this season. Like, like I just said, in that 15 game stretch, it was hardly ever easy. There was, you know, a couple of bigger wins mixed in there. But at the end of the day, it was, <laughs> they were having games against like Kansas City and Colorado and Oakland that you were expecting them to have against the Yankees and the Rays, like in Texas, like tight, difficult, frustrating ball games. And they were having that against teams that are, you know, losing a hundred games this year. And it was terrible. And the reality is, is here we are now in mid September and every single game this season pretty much has featured high leverage innings, like difficult innings, pressure innings. And, You know, so many guys have pitched so much and they're just burnt out by this point. Genesis Cabrera went the first, what, month without allowing an earned run as a Blue Jay. He allows four in game game one after Bassett comes out. Jimmy Garcia in the second game allows a couple of runs. He's pitched so much recently and he pitched so much last year. Uh, Chad Green, he's just come back from Tommy John surgery and they're trying to push him in there to pitch key innings. He allows three runs in the third game to make it kind of a blowout. And then Trevor Richards after Gosman he didn't have a great start at all. He struggled, couldn't get through five innings. And then Trevor Richards comes in because who's left to pitch? Everyone's pitched so much and he gets pumped and allows five earned runs. And the unfortunate thing here is uh, you take a look back at how Texas had performed. And previously they were coming into this as like the team in the American league East or the American league that was just collapsing. They had gone like six and 15 or something like that over their previous three weeks. They, they, they had that series against Houston where they got outscored like, 40 to 10 or something in three games. And one of the things about them that was so bad was their relief pitching just kept on blowing games. And then 
their relief pitchers against the Jays looked like, man, it was five different Mariano Rivera's back there. The Jose Leclerc comes out and he's just striking guys out with these high middle, like 95 mile an hour fastballs. And man, like the 2021 Jays, the, they would have they would have been teeing off on these yep. guys. And there's there's just there's nothing from the offense. There's there's no energy. There's no life. It's it's weird. It's stunning. It's it's just I don't know. Like I, I don't know how you can hope for anything different at this point. Like Texas didn't come into this series in a good spot and they just completely turned things around it. There's there's just no excuse. There's there's no way around it. It was so bad. D- were there any decisions made by John Schneider that you didn't like in this series? I don't know. Like I, I, I didn't love going to Richards in Game Four, but at the end of the day, like, who gives a shit? Like, you scored two runs. They both came in the first inning. Like, what? What if they bring in the the other reliever who's not going to get hit? Like, what do you do? Bring in, I don't know, Jordan Hicks there or something, and he gets through it, and it's still four to two. What are you going to do? Score two more runs? No. Obviously, that's not going to happen. Like, they had two hits between innings two and nine. They're not scoring any more runs. The only way the Jays were winning the fourth game of that series is if Vladdy hit that go-ahead home run in the first inning to make it two to one, and Kevin Gosman went seven innings and didn't allow another run, and they could bring in Mesa, Hicks, Romano, or whatever to shut things down. That's the only way this team can win a fucking game. And like sitting here and being like, "Oh, John Schneider didn't use the correct of his tired relievers at the right time that I wanted," is just like that stupid crap that you know. It obviously doesn't matter. I don't know. I don't think John Schneider is doing a great job, but the team's just trash. There's no way that you can, there's no way that you can rearrange deck chairs in the Titanic and make it float. It is what it is. Yeah. And that's a good point. Like, I mean, it, it's easy to sit here and just be like, Oh, well, if this would happen, if this would happen, like the other thing I didn't love, I don't love that they're playing with Mary that, or that they were playing with yeah. Maryfield and left field. I felt like that was an easy situation where Nate Yavaldi's on the mound. His pitch count's been extremely limited. Even though you maybe like that matchup a hair, don't lose out on one of the best defenders in the outfield in all of baseball this season. Like you can sit there and be like, oh, well, his batting average against righties in this situation is 80 points higher. Like we want that. Okay, but you're losing such a gap defensively. Yeah. And that came through. Like Whit Merrifield dropped that ball at the fence and it was hard hit and it was a tough play and all that. But also play Dalton Varsho makes in his sleep like that's what we've come to know out of him so I didn't love that but again you look back and you go okay if they don't hit that double then what they lose 6-2 instead of 9-2 like you're right it just you can sit here and rip John Schneider but at the end of the day I think this series said a lot more about the players in that clubhouse than it did about the manager in the in in the clubhouse yeah I agree I I I don't know. I have a, I've kind of flip flop back and forth on this one. The the roster construction of the team. Like, I, I think when you look at it from a distance, you look at it on paper, you can see how it could work. You have your, you have your three core guys, those hitters. Like I mentioned, you have some veteran complimentary guys like, you know, Matt Chapman, Kevin Kiermeyer, Brandon Belt, who's now injured, of course. And then you have your depth guys who are largely there because they're good defensively, like a bar show or a Kirk or a Jansen guys like that. Um, and, and the expectation is that you're going to pitch and defend your way to these low scoring wins because your big hitters are going to come through and hit home runs, score some runs late in the game. You have your lockdown bullpen. It makes some sense, but it just hasn't worked at all. And I mean, I, I, I just don't know how, how John Schneider is supposed to push buttons differently to make what feels like a very just just kind of a rotten thing just something that's not working for whatever reason something that's just missing there's just a there's a piece there that's that's just that's just missing where they don't have the energy they need for whatever reason and there's no buttons that John Schneider can press to make this work i don't think like no his decisions aren't spectacular but at the end of the day you have a team of you know expanded rosters 28 guys and more than half of them are underperforming i don't know I, I, I don't know. At some point, it's it's got to be on the players. Like, yeah, you can say that games aren't won on paper, and you can say that veteran managers can do blah, blah, blah. They can motivate their players, or they can put them in the right spots. I don't know. At the end of the day, given having watched like 140, 150 games of this team, no, it's on the players. There's so many guys who were worse this year than they were last year, worse than they were for their career averages, man. Vladdy's, his numbers this year, he's like, he's not even 2017 Kendry's Morales. He's like 2015 Chris Colabello's backup defensive replacement, Justin Smoke. You know, like, 
<laughs> like George Springer, his his OPS is similar to that of what 2016 Zeke Carrera. Like, <laughs> what are we doing here? What's John Schneider supposed to do about this? I don't know. What what do you do? Like whisper in Vladdy's ear, hey man, don't strike out in this at bat. Don't, don't, don't swing at the pitch that's eight feet out of the zone. Don't swing through that 95 mile an hour fastball down the middle. Don't do that. Why isn't John Schneider saying that? Why isn't he managing? Like, what do you think? The players aren't getting the job done. They're not it's it's not on the manager. It's that's just it's just lazy. I'm not going to try one up that rant because it was beautiful. Um, but it also reminds me that at bat with the bases loaded when Bo struck out, George Springer walked on four straight balls. The fifth pitch to Bo, the first pitch to Bo was a fifth straight ball. And the next pitch was whatever was a slider or a splitter, like eight inches below the zone. And he wailed on it and whiffed so bad. And it's just like, I it, I don't know, man. Their approach is just so terrible. And I do understand some people who are like, it's a Guillermo or maybe it's a Don Mattingly thing. Like maybe they're just not getting grilled enough on how they're approaching at bats. But at the same time, I would certainly hope your superstar shortstop has a bit more baseball sense than to be like, I should swing out of my shoes after the pitcher's throw. And I think it might have even been six straight balls when you loop in the batter before. Like, I'm just going to swing out of my shoes at whatever he throws me. It's like in the dirt. And he's like one hand on the bat extending through it. Like, their approach was just miserable that whole series. It has been all year. Like uh, that's just, that's just why it's hard to be like something's going to magically change. It's very very hard to believe that right now. Yeah. <sighs> Anyways, let's. Uh, <laughs> I think we've said our piece. We're 22 minutes or whatever into this podcast, and it has been mainly miserable. Um, so let's let's try to look ahead. We're going to try outline a path to this team getting to the postseason, and we'll catch up with uh, Brett Holden. But first, we'll step aside for a quick break. Moving along on Blue Jays Nation Radio, episode 180. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube yet, make sure you go and do that. We got a ton of video content going up there. We're growing out the YouTube platform a little bit. And a big reason why is because we got our guy Brett Holden around to do some of that. Uh, let's get to the AL East report, the AL wildcard report. Brett, what is going on and how did the out of town scoreboard affect the Jays? You know what? Some interesting names getting some wins and an interesting name that we're actually going to talk serious about at some point in this conversation. But let's start with the teams that the Jays are now trailing. Starting off with the Tampa Bay Rays, who are not only nine games ahead of all wildcard teams, they're now only a game back of the Baltimore Orioles in the AL East for the AL East lead. And that comes thanks to their series against the Minnesota Twins. Two wins against the Twins in that series. And now they are playing against the Baltimore Orioles, who they are trailing, who they got a win against just last night. They do have a uh, another game today. The Rays got a 4-3 win against the Orioles in game one. And today, Zach Eflin will face Jack Flaherty. So a game that obviously the Orioles acquired Flaherty for. This is a big test. Now for the Tampa Bay Rays, Manuel Margot has been activated from the IL with, now try and keep track with me here, Right elbow loose bodies, whatever that may incur, but he is back. Uh, but Sounds that also, yeah, uh, you know what? I've been feeling one of those as well. But uh, <laughs> uh, Videl Bruhan was optioned back to AAA. And the only reason why I mentioned that is because remember when he was a big prospect, everybody was excited for Bruhan to come, come up. And well, now he's the option player to be up and down. But let's move on to those Texas Rangers that we mentioned about. Obviously, that tough series against uh, the Jays here. But ever since that series, you mentioned Coomsey, that series against the Houston Astros, they were outscored 39-10 to 10 in that series. Since then, they have outscored opponents 50 50- to 21 including the toronto blue jays they have the cleveland guardians coming up next now some injury news as well with the texas rangers is max scherzer who we have been talking about with that uh, arm fatigue he will miss the rest of the regular season and likely playoffs as well if they do make it i'm still being hopeful boys uh josh young (laughs) also is probably going to return soon probably around September 18th, either this weekend or just after the weekend after he had surgery on his left 
thumb fracture. So that would be his glove hand. So that's, I mean, you're making impact on your left thumb all the time. That's not an easy one to come back from. And Adolis Garcia as well could join the team again today, which could mean uh, some movement as well for the Rays. Obviously, they brought up their young guy, I believe, Evan Carter, if I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head. Um, so he another player to watch if he goes up or down or stays up or down. Now let's move to the Seattle Mariners who had a little bit of a tough time, a little bit in Los Angeles as the first game of the series against the angels. They lost eight to five, but after that it was relatively smooth sailing eight, nothing win for the Mariners in the second game. And then three, two in the final game. Now they stay in LA but they head to Chavez Ravine, the Los Angeles Dodgers. And today in game one, we got Bobby Miller against George Kirby, a big young matchup there. A lot of love for Bobby Miller as well. Another injury note for the Mariners too, Jared Kalenic made his return on Monday. However, he fouled the ball right onto his foot and has not played since. So a, a tough season for Jared Kalenic's lower half, specifically his little feet. But uh, we shall see if his, uh, again, another former top prospect who's been having a tumultuous time in the big leagues too. We shall see if he can return because he was having a pretty decent year as well. The Boston Red Sox. Now these are the two teams that are pretty interesting here. The Red Sox just came off a series win. Well, excuse me, a series loss against the New York Yankees, which has shot the Yankees back into a tie with the Red Sox for uh, the AL wildcard race. They lost 3-2 uh, against the Yankees in game one, 4-1 in game two, did beat the Yankees 5-0 in game three, but the Yankees would go on to take the series 8-5. to As you know, Tyler, as you'll probably be there, they face the Blue Jays next. And a lot of news around the Red Sox as well in the middle of this wildcard race. They fired their chief baseball officer, Heim Bloom, after four years with the Red Sox. And his marquee move would be not keeping really anybody, but moving pieces like uh, Mookie Betts, kind of. Maybe if you remember that move. Uh, Bill O'Halloran will also not stay as their general manager as well, so they're completely cleaning house. But also some injuries, sicknesses around the Red Sox in this tough race. Kenley Jansen was placed on the COVID-19 list. But Corey Kluber gets eight outs in his AAA rehab start. Corey Kluber could rejoin the team down the stretch here for a team that obviously needs him. And finally, those New York Yankees. Yes, the team that we kind of joked about the last couple of weeks, but... They're in a tie with the Boston Red Sox. We mentioned they take a 3-1 series win over those Red Sox. And now they head to Steel City with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Some injury news there as well as Jason Dominguez did have Tommy John surgery. Now that timeline is about 9 to 10 months for a, an outfielder. That could be a big bat for them to return next year. Maybe, but... That's next year. One last note to talk about with the New York Yankees. Some An interesting report came out from Chris Henrique. Henrique, I may be dipping into the hockey field there, but uh, he mentioned and reported that the Boston Red Sox actually discussed sending outfielder uh, Alex Verdugo to the New York Yankees at the deadline in exchange for Clark Schmidt. So we might have been having a very different conversation right now if Verdugo was sent there. Maybe Jason Dominguez doesn't get sent up or called up, doesn't tear his UCL, whatever. But pretty interesting name that the Boston Red Sox may be shopping around in the offseason here as well. It'll be an interesting offseason in Boston for sure. Thank you, Brett, with the little AL wildcard report there. Coombsy, let's talk a little bit more about that chain bloom news. Were you surprised when that broke? I'm surprised at the timing, but I think they're trying to get a head start now on I, I I would guess based on the timing that they're thinking that there's I don't know, maybe they have some candidates that they're worried about getting a gig elsewhere. So they're trying to get out in front of it, you know, firing a GM usually with two weeks left in the season, you'd assume that's why they're doing that. I don't really think Bloom did a terrible job with Boston. I thought his situation was pretty rough. He came in, you know, right after they had won the world, uh, shortly after they had won the world series in 2018, there was no farm system. There was a whole bunch of really expensive contracts that Dave Dombrowski had signed. 
uh, ownership push for them to make the Mookie Betts trade. That was a terrible one. They attached David Price's contract to it and wound up getting significantly less back. Uh, and Mookie Betts, of course, has gone on to be one of the best players in Major League Baseball since joining the LA Dodgers. So that sucked. But I mean, yeah, I don't know. I guess the 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 conversation now after the season the Boston had, and if Toronto keeps going this way, it's pretty reasonable to ask: Are is Bros Atkins going to get another kick at this? They have James Click, who of course was um, won the World Series with the Houston Astros recently. He's there. There's um, reason to believe that the Red Sox fired Bloom at this point, possibly because they want to get a leg up on hiring a guy, maybe like click. It's not, you know, I, I don't know if that's going to be the guy specifically, but he's a name that's already been thrown out there. So I guess from a Blue Jays perspective, if this keeps going South, then I don't know, the, the Atkins era might come to an end. I, I don't think there's any suggestion that Mark Shapiro is going to be out as CEO, but Atkins might be the fall guy here. He's already fired a manager. If if the Jays miss the playoffs this year, Rogers is not going to be happy. Like they're, you know, they put all this money into the team. They put all the money into the renovations. They're expecting playoff revenue this year. And if that doesn't happen, then I, I'd be shocked if there wasn't changes. Yeah, I was going to say, do you think Ross Atkins gets an interview for this Red Sox gig in the winter? <laughs> I don't think uh, Ross Atkins will. I think it'll be James Click. I don't know. I, I don't think Atkins has been terrible. I think he's done a lot of good things. I just, I don't know. I there's there's something missing from these teams i wonder if it's is it the vibes who knows but there's just something missing i think that they've had a good process like i explained a few minutes ago i can see what they're trying to do i can see how it could work in the playoffs with the great pitching and the great defense i think it would work if your bigger three hitters came through but you have to ask yourself why so many guys are having down years at the same time there has to be something wrong is it is it coaching is it who knows? Is it is it roster composition? Is it a mix of everything? It's honestly impossible to say. The, the, the guys just buy into their own hype too much. Or is building a team around guys like Bo and Vladdy who haven't experienced a tremendous amount of adversity? Is is that what went wrong? I honestly don't know. There's a there's a million different things. I it's so hard to say. Boston's fired their GM from this season. And to be totally honest, I wouldn't be surprised if 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 the Blue Jays follow suit if they miss the playoffs. Even if they do and get swept by Minnesota, what does that mean? Yep, nothing like yeah and it's a run it's it's a long playoff run or it's big changes this winter in toronto just like i mean boston's just getting ahead of the curve I, I think you're bang on with you make this decision now because you probably have a few people in mind and you go we want our pick if you're the boston red sox you'd probably have your pick anyways but just getting out in front of it is i think kind of a smart play for them because their season is over and they're rolling into Toronto this week. And as the Jays will look to keep their season, really try to keep their season alive in most ways. I mentioned that I'll outline, you know, the path for the Jays to get to the postseason here. Coombsy, 15 games to go for the Jays. And I honestly think 10 and 5 might be enough to get them into the playoffs, which is like a little depressing because you'd like, you know, they can basically stumble their way in. But when you look at the schedules for the three teams, again, we have to keep remembering they only need to catch one of Seattle, Houston, or Texas. And you look, Seattle in their final, what would be, I think, 14 games or 16 games. Sorry, they have a game in hand. Um, they got to play Texas three six times and the Astros three times. Sorry, Texas seven times and the Astros yeah. three times. That's 10 head-to-head -head games right there. So, again, the Astros have that series against the Mariners. Obviously, the Rangers are playing them a ton. Like The fact that there's so much baseball to be played between those three teams so there's got to be a loser on basically 10 straight nights it, down the stretch here in the final 15. There's got to be a loser out of that group, which means if you're the Jays, one, you still fully control your own destiny because someone's going to be losing those ball games. If you go 12 and three, you're getting in. It's not like you can go 12 and three and everyone else in this playoff race can also go 12 and three and match you, right? So they still control their own destiny, which is a wild thing to say. Also, the Mariners, as Brett said, they got to play the Dodgers this weekend. That's not going to be easy at all. So the door is still open. It, it's, it, it closed a lot this, this week, but it's not totally closed yet. Yeah, it's definitely, I, I, as negative as that was and as fun as it was to rant about how yeah. bad it was and the rotten core, fire everybody, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. They're not in the, they're not in a terrible spot there. If, if, I mean, to be, it's kind of funny. Imagine telling a Jays fan back in like the mid late two thousands that it would be, you know, mid September and they're a game and a half out of a wild card spot. It was, it, 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 I, I watched the Jays for a full decade where that was never the thing. 
I started watching baseball in like 2003 and it wasn't until 2015 or 2014, I guess they were somewhat close that, that they were even in the mix. And here we are now a game and a half out of the playoffs and bear in mind, it's basically two and a half games because Seattle has the tie break. Texas also has the tie break. The only team that the Jays have the tiebreaker on from winning their head to head is uh, the Houston Astros. So if the Jays and Astros finish tied, then the Jays jump them, Texas and Seattle, those teams wind up on top, but yeah, things could obviously be a lot better if they had even just split with Texas and they were, you know, tied in the standings or a game ahead in the standings. But at the end of the day, like if the Jays can go ahead and put together a decent stretch here, like you said, 10 and 5, 11 and 4 kind of thing, then it's entirely possible that the Mariners just do worse down the stretch and they're in their difficult schedule and they're the ones who wind up missing out. The 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 Mariners have three against the Dodgers, then they have an easy series against Oakland, then like you said, it's at Texas for three, at home against Houston for three, and then at home against Texas for four. And if if the Rangers continue ripping after this series and they're they're hot later and they're trying to win the division, which obviously they will be, and they take like five of seven from Seattle in those games, then it opens a pretty nice door for the Jays to still make the playoffs. And to be completely honest, it would be the most 2023 Blue Jays thing imaginable for them just to like limp into the playoffs. They they have like they they inexplicably do well against like Tampa Bay down the stretch. They're winning games at the trop. Everyone's like, what is this? And then they just bullshit their way to uh, like a wild card series win against somebody. Like, would it even be that shocking? No, not really. Like <laughs> when you squint and when you look hard enough, you can see how this team can be successful. But given the way they played recently, it's very hard to imagine. Um, they're going to need a lot of help. They're going to need either Texas or Seattle to implode. One of the two. It can't be you know, Texas going four and three against Seattle. It has to be one of them going like five and two, six and one in those seven games. And the Jays have to get their shit together and beat, you know, Boston and the Yankees and the Rays. None of those teams are bad. Two of them are mediocre. The Rays are very good. So 15 games left here. I hate doing this like minimum record thing because I don't know, it's not really true, but because yeah. we, we kind of saw that during that other 15 game stretch. Yeah. 10 and five, but I mean, I don't know. It comes down to what the other teams do. It feels a lot like 2021. Remember that when it was like, oh, we, you know, they're two games back and we need Boston to lose today. We need New York to lose today. I feel like this is setting up for yet again, missing the playoffs on like game 161 or 162. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't want to get excited because I don't want to, I don't want to have my heart ripped out. So I'm just going to be apathetic. I think it's possible, but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, for a second, we had you back, though. For a brief for a moment there in that rant, you were like, "Damn, they might beat Minnesota and go to the AL or go to no. the divisional series." <laughs> no, I'm, I, I, no, I, I said that. I heard it out loud, and I was like, "No, I'm not attaching that. I'm not saying that. I'm not going to have someone come on to Twitter and quote that and be like." Cam said this, he's doing drugs. And like, uh, cool. no, I don't need that again. So I'm not, I'm not having that attached to my name. I don't believe in the Blue Jays, but it is possible. It's technically possible. It is technically possible. Three gamer against the Red Sox. If we wanted to do the minimum record thing again, like there's an outside chance they get in with 10 and five. There's an okay chance they get in 11 and four. I think you're a lock to get in if you can find a way to go 12 and three in these final 15, which would be a mountain of a task. But you do yourselves a lot of favors if you can sweep the Red Sox this weekend. Jose Barrios versus Brian Bayo in game one. Roberto Clemente, bobblehead giveaway day at the Dome. Chris Bassett versus Chris Sale in game two. Hunjin Ryu against the Canadian Nick Pavetta, who uh, seems to pitch pretty well when he gets these opportunities. So it'll be a tough one. Uh, this is a Red Sox team that is clearly capable of still winning ball games, even though they're kind of out of it. Jays are going to have to buckle up and get the job done here before an off day Monday. So a decent opportunity this weekend at the Dome for Toronto. Coombsy, give me a series MVP pick if the Jays are going to get this thing done. Oh, man. Who it's got to be had... one of the big three, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Let's. Uh... Uh, no, I think it's going to be one of the random rookies again. I'm looking for ah. a big Davis Schneider weekend. I don't believe I like in the that. big three. If the Jays are going to make the playoffs, it's going to be pitching in their Buffalo boys. That's what, that's who's going to do it. Pitching in the Buffalo boys. I don't mind that at all. I'd love to see a big Davis Schneider weekend at the Dome. I'm uh, heading to one more game, maybe two. I haven't decided yet if I'm doing the one on Saturday. I really hope I didn't fly all the way out here, Coombsy, to watch three straight losses. Uh, uh, thank you. Oh, sorry. Thanks for tuning in to Blue Jays Nation Radio, episode 180, brought to you by Botano. Coombsy, enjoy the weekend. I will try my best. Best wishes. Thanks for tuning in to Blue Jays Nation Radio. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode.